Hello, we're your clinicians. This is Ali Nase. It's a very cold day here in the at uh, the end of November, and to continue the tradition of doing uh, you know tutorials on the area of atheroectomy in cold days in the park, I wanted to just do one more here tutorial for you today on the area of epicoectomy and the newly developed technique uh, by Rewaldendo called the lid technique. So uh, let's get into it. Let's go back to the board and talk about epicoectomy and retrofilling materials. A little bit of historically before we talk about the lid technique, which is the purpose of this video, I'd like to just talk to you about some of the materials that have come about in the past uh, historically in endodontic uh, surgery, specifically for retrofilling. Now, we know that the purpose of uh, apicoectomy is to address a problem with the tooth that has had a previous root canal therapy in which a retreatment or a revision non-surgically is not possible. This usually is the case where there is a post or if the best attempt possible has already been made using the uh, non-surgical techniques, and now the only way to do would be to go in there and do an apico. And what an apicoectomy is, is basically when you have your root end, and this is a root canal treated tooth, uh, what you would do is you would cut off about three millimeter of the root end and then prepare, today and nowadays you can use ultrasonics for this purpose, and prepare a, um, about another three millimeter deep kind of a preparation here that would then allow you to remove effectively six millimeters of the root end and put a little plug. The idea and the way I usually explain this to patients, it's the equivalent of putting your cork in a bottle. If you have bacteria remaining in a bottle and it's leaking out from the end of the uh, bottle, what you're doing in a picoectomy and retrofilling procedure is putting your cork in it and closing it off. So that is essentially the cork. Now, the cork historically has been uh, several different materials. I think the one that has been used uh, most uh, historically has been amalgam. Uh, so. Amalgam has been one of the most common and historical materials, and it, was, it did a fairly good job uh, until the newer materials came around. The problem with amalgam is that, first of all, it doesn't create any kind of a bond. It is a metal. It does corrode over time. It can create staining, tattooing even of the gum, and it creates corrosion products. And also, in time, amalgams can expand, and it creates a potential cracking of the remaining tooth structure that would be a problem. So the goal of retrofilling materials has always been to create some kind of a bonded material. But, the, and that's why later on, of course, through this transition from amalgam, we used zinc oxide eugenol based materials and even cavit and uh, things like that. However, none of these materials were good because the ZOE and the cavit would resorb out of the root and therefore they were not good. Then, in our quest to find bonding materials for retrofilling, we moved on to use uh, glass ionomers, so glass ionomer cements, and then later on composites. So, um, composites uh, seem to, a number of research showed that they had the best kind of bond in vitro. So when you're using extracted teeth, you will end up having very good um, bonding using composite and very good uh, seal. Unfortunately, we're not dealing with extracted teeth and therefore composite really didn't catch on because doing apicoectomy is in an area where you have a lot of moisture, there's blood and so on, so you can't use composites. Uh, a hybrid between GIC and composite, a Geristor um, was a common material um, before the advent of the bioceramics, but that material is also very technique sensitive. And again, moisture control is the biggest problem in all of these materials, which all of them are fairly uh, hydrophobic. Of course, amalgam is hydro not hydrophilic, but it's not quite as affected by moisture, but that's a different story. All right, so let's move on. All of these materials were the materials that we had to work with, and these are the cases, these are the materials from which we um, drew a lot of the conclusions for a number of um, success and failure studies in endodontics that then paved the way for us to define um, apicoectomy as a viable or as a risky potential alternative for saving teeth. Of course, all of those studies have to be thrown out until the uh, use of uh, the advent of the first biceramic material, which as I've said before, was MTA. So mineral trioxide aggregate 
was the same first by ceramic that came out on the market and it was fairly hydrophilic and also had some bonding properties. Uh, the only problem with MTA however was its handling properties because you ended up having basically some powder you know and then you had to mix it with water and, and then you ended up getting a basically a dollop of mud that you had to transfer from here outside the mouth into this retrofilling uh, uh, space. And that didn't quite, uh, it wasn't very easy. So a lot of people were also using another material called Super EBA, which is, um, which was also a good material. Again, it wasn't, it was also hydrophobic. It didn't quite have the same properties as a biceramics and it didn't bond, it just, turned very hard, uh, it, it was good, but very difficult handling properties once again. So Super EBA also kind of fell a little bit out of favor, only a few people used it, uh, but it was all of this stuff obviously changed when the first uh, nanoparticulate by ceramic materials came around, and that was, as we've seen in the previous tutorials, have been the, um, the endosequence uh, root repair material, the putty. Uh, originally what we did is we used, we described a technique in which you would just use the putty and um, you could turn it into a cone and then stuff it into this uh, retro preparation and incrementally fill it up. Well, kind of the same way as you were using it, the MTA. However, this technique, as I ended up seeing over time as I kind of tested with it, it was difficult because getting this putty material three millimeters down into the root sometimes would create a little bit of a void at the very end, right here. And it, it, again, it took a lot of time to do incremental packing of the material. So I figured what's an easy way of dealing with that is when we describe the technique in which you would use an acid etch lure lock based um, tip, you would bend it 90 degrees using, uh, you know, using bird beak pliers or whatever other pliers you had and then you were able to put an endo sequence syringe in there and you could use the RRM syringable material and you would inject you know a little bit of this uh, RRM material into the retro preparation and backfill it up. So that was the idea that you would backfill from the bottom up and then you would put some cones into the uh, cones of the putty material. So we had really two materials. You had the syringable material and the putty material that the combination of which you could use to uh, then uh, fill uh, the retro preparation for your retrofill. And the idea was kind of like using almost like impression materials, using a light body material and a heavy body material, using the heavy body to push the light body into places and then um, uh, sealing it. About a year ago or so, I did another tutorial out in the park in the middle of the cold uh, weather and um, I described this newer way, uh, the, the technique that I call the lid technique. And this lid technique is basically instead of using these cones of the putty, I said, why don't we just make it even easier and faster and simply use uh, the syringable material to fill all the way up here and then just take a little round or a little ball, if you will, of a little ball of the putty and immediately just smear it up on top of this uh, area and just smear it down with a little micro spatula. And this technique proved to be far more efficient so that the retro fillings that I do now literally take 10 seconds per route. So it's an it's incredibly more efficient technique. I have checked, I had, I had originally checked with the scientists who developed this uh, sealer material and so on, whether this compatibility exists between the sealer material or the syringable material and the putty. And I was assured that this, they're basically the same thing and there would be no problem that would bond to each other without an issue. And so over the past about three years now, I've been using this technique as an alternative to placing cones and I've been reaping the benefits of having a far more efficient retrofilling technique, but I've also seen the results and I'm very, very uh, impressed with the fact that this technique really works and it's very efficient. So moving forward, and this is the part that I'm um, trying to communicate to people that are trying to be a little bit more efficient doing retrofillings and apicoectomies as a whole, is to use the syringable material. Uh, the, the syringe tip goes all the way down to the bottom 
of the retro preparation and then you pull up as you slowly inject. The key is to think about this the same way you do your core buildups, the same way you would do uh, your uh, back filling if you're using thermoplastic at aperture. And then this way you don't end up trapping any voids and get any bubbles here in the preparation. If you, if you inject slowly as you move back up, then you will end up having a nice complete fill of the retro uh, preparation with your uh, either seal sealer or the uh, RRM syringable material. So it's a combination of the syringable and the putty that together allow you the synergistic effect. The RRM fast set putty, fast set putty here, you get a little ball of it and then you seal the top. So therefore, here's the concept. The concept becomes that the syringable material actually seals, acts as the retrofilling material and the fast set putty acts as a lid, as a little barrier because if you only fill the whole thing up with the syringable material, because it's going to be a lot of blood as soon as you're done, it could potentially wash it out. Uh, so the putty acts as a little lid that, that, that just seals the surface of the retro preparation uh, and right over the retrofill material and that gives you the required time for the material to set uh, and therefore not wash out. All right, so I've taken a lot of time already. Let's take a look at a couple of cases together. Okay, this tooth number 13 was referred to my practice for evaluation. Uh, this tooth had a history of endodontic therapy a couple of years uh, earlier by a patient's endodontist and uh, there is a periapical lesion. The patient complains of periapical sensitivity to uh, touch, to percussion, and to chewing in this area. And a restoration had also been placed, a full uh, coronal restoration had been placed also within the past couple of years. A post is also present. Uh, the quality of the root canal filling and the core and the uh, crown appears very adequate. There is a slight um, uh, extrusion of uh, sealer material past the apex and there are also some particles you can see in the apex in the peripheral lesion that appear to be of metal type. Upon further inquiry it turned out that the root canal had been a retreatment of a previously existing